Shakespeare's Sonnet 116 is the famous marriage sonnet, it's probably the most famous sonnet, usually read at weddings. And there's really two ways to read this. One, as an isolated poem that's a great love poem, it's a great poem about marriage. And the other way to read it is in context with the other sonnets, in which it really is not that, I think. So we'll, we'll consider that. I think both ways are, 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 are valid. You know, there's something to be said about how these sonnets have survived as poems that have often been taken out of context and applied in various different ways to other contexts. I talked a lot about that in Sonnet 87, which is very ambiguous. Most of the sonnets are ambiguous, and because they're ambiguous, they have this plasticity. You can take them and use them different ways. Now, in the context of this sonnet, I think that the speaker is, is really not praising marriage in the way that most people read this sonnet. So we're, we're going to read it, and we'll consider both ways. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Now notice how I read that. I read it the way most people read it at weddings, with a trochee, with two trochees. Let me not to the marriage of true minds. That's usually how it's read, but if we're gonna read it in iambic pentameter, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, okay? With the stress here, the speaker sounds like someone in the audience of a marriage or of a wedding, not one participating in the marriage and not one praising marriage. Helen Vindler talks about this. One of the things she, she says is that this sonnet has way too many negatives to be a good, a true positive statement on marriage. She thinks that he's parroting, the speaker is parroting um, lines from the interlocutor. I think that's a bit, it, that's, it's very compelling, but it might be too far. So let's, let's read it this way. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, just to get a plain sense of what's being said here. What are impediments? This comes from the language of the Book of Common Prayer, the marriage rite. It's another way of saying, does anyone have any objections? So the speaker says, let me not offer any objections to this marriage, or to marriage in general. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Now in context with the other sonnets that we've read before, it seems like the beloved, whom we noticed in sonnets 70s uh, through the 80s, those sonnets, even some of the sonnet 90s, um, the, the beloved is moving away, is being removed from the speaker, the lover. And the speaker is coming to terms with that. So if we're going to read this in context, it seems like the beloved, the subject of the poet's sonnets, Ha, is getting married and the speaker is proclaiming his love for him still he says that my love or love in general is not love which alters or changes when changes are found or bends with the remover to remove so it's almost like he's saying even though you the beloved the subject of all of my love poems are going off and are getting married my love will not change Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark. And we do pronounce the ed here to get the tenth syllable. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Now you see, you, you, you can pick up on what Vendler is talking about here. Here's the positive statement, it is. But it's preceded by the negative, just as this statement suddenly turned negative here. Love is not love which alters when it alterations find. Love is constant no matter the circumstance. It is the star to every wandering bark, every wandering ship. It's the North Star by which they can find their way home, find their way on a map, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Thus, love is immutable. The, the Elizabethans were very interested in immutability. In, uh, in change, in changelessness. This theme is, is taken up here. Here in the third quatrain, love's not time's fool. Here again is a statement 
in the negative. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Beautiful line here. We noticed how love takes its toll on the body's beauty. This we noticed from the beginning, really, in Sonnet 1, in Sonnet 2, Sonnet 12, all of these sonnets that we've looked at in this series, in this playlist, many of them have dealt with this theme of time wearing away at a person's beauty. But love is not that. Love outlives beauty and is not time's fool. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. And notice here's that rhyme, come and doom, which rhymed in the original pronunciation, but we also saw this in Sonnet 107. Now notice too the repetition that's going on, the call and response between these two quatrains. The first one alters, bends. We have the same thing happening here. Alters, the bending sickle. You know, the scythe that time has, the grim reaper, he's, he's reaping the grain, and he's got that sickle, another image that shows up in a lot of Shakespeare's poems. We saw it show up in Sonnet 60, for instance, Sonnet 12. Uh, it's there, time with his sickle, coming to mow down life, but love outlasts time's sickle. And then the solemn oath, this legal oath, if this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. So on the surface, you can read this as a testimony to the power of love against changes in beauty, changes of time, of death, of inconstancy. And all of that is true. But within the context of the sonnets, it does seem like this speaker seems to be declaring the power of his own love and also seems not to be very happy with the situation at hand, whatever that is. As I said, Helen Vendler's uh, commentary on this poem is interesting. Stephen Booth also talks about how this sonnet is uh, very ambiguous in what it can mean. And Colin Burrow also mentions this in his uh, annotated commentary on the sonnets. Something to look into. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone at the weddings who have who've been reciting this have been misreading it, but in context this poem does have a very different light. Something to be aware, aware of, but it's a beautiful sonnet about the power of love, really. Thanks everyone for watching, and we will be reading Sonnet 126 in the next video. Until next time.